Animals are changing very much from the, the sort of traditional property paradigm for what are animals into something that is more like a guardianship model. You can go out and make change in the world and you don't have to have everybody behind you. You can you can get everybody behind you with a good story. Those are beings that are sharing this earth with us and they are completely and totally vulnerable to the decisions that we make. Welcome to the pilot episode of the Amicus Briefs podcast. I'm Leslie Grove, web developer. And I'm Rachel Evans, web coordinator. Leslie and I share an office in the Law Library Annex and often work together on the law school website and other projects. And outside of work, we've done some creative collaborations together with electronic music. So when some ideas recently were welcomed in the library for a podcast, it seemed only natural that the two of us seize this opportunity and combine some of our personal and professional interests. Each episode, we'll be talking with students, staff, faculty, and librarians to focus on a particular topic that relates to working or studying here at the Law Library, keeping you informed of events, sharing resources, and helping you to stay more connected with the University of Georgia School of Law community. As you could probably guess from the intro, today's topic is animals. We have Anne Burnett with us now to talk about the law school's monthly newsletter, which is called Amicus Briefs. Anne is our foreign and international law librarian. She's currently teaching an advanced legal research course, and she's active in the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, to name just one of her many professional activities. And I think it's safe to say that Anne loves her animals. And how many dogs do you have now? Right now I have one, believe it or not. Uh, but at our peak, we had three dogs and two cats and spent a lot of time at the vet and trimming dog nails and that type of thing. And what is Amicus Briefs? What does it mean? And how did the newsletter originally start? Okay. So um, an Amicus Brief is a brief that's filed by a, um, an entity that is not a party to a litigation, like to a court um, action, but they have some kind of an interest in it. So you'll see like the ACLU is often um, gets Amicus status. They'll say amicus curiae is what they'll be designated. And they have to seek permission from the court to do it. Um, and there will be some really high profile cases where there will be 45 amicus curiae. And they file a brief with the court outlining their viewpoints about what should happen. It technically means um, friend of the court. So uh, the newsletter actually was just called like University of Georgia School of Law Library News. And I got here in 96, and we decided in the fall of 96 to have a contest and opened it up to the students um, and faculty and staff. And Amicus Briefs was the, the winning um, entry. So I looked up. The other entries were, uh, let's see, uh, In Ray Library um, was the third place winner, and Stack Chat was the second place winner. So all these years, it could have been called one of those names instead of um, Amicus Briefs. I think I prefer Amicus Briefs to the other ones now that I'm hearing yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty clear-cut winner. So that was in, uh, I think the first issue that came out under that name was um, January of 97. And was it in print originally or online? Okay, so originally it was definitely in print. Um, and uh, it was clearly typed up on a typewriter. Um, the oldest issue that we've been able to find was volume one, number two. So volume one, number one is still out there missing. Um, let's see, when I got here in 96, it was still in print. Uh, we printed it up sent a file over to Campus Duplicating, and they would print up all um, print copies for every student, every faculty member, every staff member, and we would distribute them to their mailboxes. And no, the students don't even have mailboxes because there's really not that much print stuff to put in them anymore. I'm trying to remember when we added the online version. It was pretty soon after I got here, and I was really... Um, 
excited to be able to use my my newly learned HTML skills. And so I was like, we're <laughs> going to make this be online. And uh, Carol Watson had not that long before, uh, she was um, at the time the computing services librarian, uh, actually set up a web server for the law school. And we're like, we got to put stuff on that web server. <laughs> so at that point, I was doing the print version that got put in the student and faculty and staff mailboxes, and it got um, mailed, I want to say we mailed it out to about 40 different places, um, maybe some other interested law libraries and other people. Um, and so then I was doing two sets of formatting because I was doing a print version that I did in PageMaker. You remember PageMaker? Yeah. And then, um, and then the HTML version with the same content. So it's kind of like what goes around comes around because after Rachel started doing the newsletter again, uh, then we added back in a print version because we for years we did just a just an online version. So I see that you have a copy of volume one, number two, yeah. one of the earliest ones here in print. What date did that originally come out? So when when did this start? September nineteen eighty four. Cool. So we do not know us. when volume one, number one came out. But, <laughs> but safe to say in 1984? Probably. Um, I think volume one, number three came out maybe December of 84. So I think they were on a roll. Cool. Yeah. So keep your eyes out to see if uh, volume one, number one ever shows up in any files you come across. <laughs> Can you tell us the headlines? Uh, West Horn Books. They are being um, added to our collection and shelved in the reserve area. And Westlaw and Lexus training. And that's pretty much it. And today we have a copy with us here of one of the most popular features of Amicus Briefs. Would you like to tell us about the, the law dogs? Yeah. Well, law dog, I wish I could claim that law dog was my idea. I think we saw somebody else was doing some kind of a feature of, you know, picking a dog of the month. Um, but we thought with the, you know, with the UGA Bulldogs that law dog had a special meaning to us. And it actually goes back further. I would have told you that I thought we started doing it maybe five years ago, but we actually started doing it in September of 2008. So it went back a long ways. And the very first issue of the newsletter that we included Law Dog in was a compilation of all of the law library staff members' pets. So um, I didn't bring a copy of that, but there are probably a dozen pets that showed up in that first time that we featured Law Dogs. And it's been a very popular part of the newsletter ever since. It's the first thing I look at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's one of the funnest things I get to do is I receive the submissions, so I get to see every time somebody sends in a uh, a submission. It's like, oh, it's a new law dog or law horse or law fish or <laughs> law pig. Um, I was about to say, what what other animals have we featured as honorary law dogs over the years? We've definitely had birds. Um, we've had Rachel's chickens. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've had turtles. Uh, let me think what else we have had. We've had a bearded dragon this year, uh, which I believe is Australian. I, I had to look it up, but very cute bearded dragon. And lots of cats. Lots of cats. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of almost just count. We say that the non-dogs are honorary law dogs, but I almost just count cats as just regular law dogs. But So, yeah, quite a few cats. And very photogenic um, animals across the board. You know, really, really cute pictures. And... For the ones that our students submit, it's very clear that the that their animal companions are, you know, really helping them to get through law school um, with a little bit more sanity. So they they definitely um, play a big role in our law school community for that reason. I think. Is there a photo that comes to mind when you say something like that? For example, in this issue, the standout photo for me as far as like a pet that is clearly helping their student through law school would be Will, the cat that lives with 3L, Shelly Crotchet. This cat is like really looking over her with her book and her computer. Yeah. Are there other um, other sort of memorable ones or any pets that come to mind? We have had several, um, actually, usually cats who are clearly... Um, trying to interfere with their person studying. <laughs> They're like stretched out on their books. You know how cats do that. Oh, yeah. And it's like, no, you're not paying me enough attention, which is probably good because it probably makes their person take a break, which is a healthy thing to do. Is there anything that you would like to say about the law dogs that we have in this 
this current issue. Uh, we had a huge what we called year-end roundup of 12 pets. So what was the thinking behind um, which ones made the cut for this year-end? So these were um, either submitted by 3L students who we know will be graduating, and we wanted to make sure that their um, submissions um, got to see the light of day because um, every single one of them is just so cute and important. And then uh, a number of the other ones were submitted by staff and faculty in the law school, and they had been in the hopper, I say, for quite a while because we get many more submissions than what we can put in. You know, we just pick one law dog a month. So I pulled them randomly, and these were ones that just had not been pulled. Um, so there's no uh, value attached to who gets picked or not. Uh, but, I mean, every single one of these is absolutely adorable. Mm -hmm. And important to their person, obviously, but we also like to include them as part of our community. Uh, one of these was from an LLM student, and it might be, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it might be the first time that one of our foreign trained lawyers has submitted a law doc. I noticed that one when I was, when I was typing in the captions for this, and I added LLM, I thought, I don't remember seeing LLM before. I don't, I don't think we ever have had one submitted. So I hope I'm not forgetting somebody, but it's it stands out to me as probably the first time. And that's uh, this little Frodo, which yeah. is a, a pug. <laughs> little Frodo um, with uh, Urvashi Jane, who is one of our current LLM students getting ready to graduate. The uh, bull terrier up at the front, that's at the top of the print version anyway, uh, is Brandy. And I had to ask what Brandy is, I was pretty sure that she's a, a bull terrier, but they said, yes, she's a bull terrier, just like the target dog. And they've uh, got her decked out in all the UGA gear. <laughs> she, she looks like she's ready to go to a football game. And then another one that was in this issue was uh, Hazel, who is a little rescue dog that uh, Laura Woodson, who's in our career services, career development office, um, who also happened to be one of my law school classmates. She and another one of our classmates, Kathy Dixon, rescued Hazel about eight years ago, along with two other little Yorkie mixes who were in a um, not very good situation. And so I wanted to give a special shout out to Laura and Kathy for um, rescuing those dogs and giving them a good home for all these years. A lot of the law dogs have you know, good rescue stories behind them. There was so. another one I was going to mention um, that I noticed in the comments. We didn't have the space in the print version to include all of the comments with each pet that were submitted. But in the online version, uh, you can read more about each pet. And Stormy, that lives with administrative associate Tina Whitehair, who works in the dean's office, I believe that was one that was saved from Campus Cats. Yeah, Campus Cats rescued Stormy um, apparently out of a storm drain. And I believe that he was either missing an eye or had to have it removed um, shortly thereafter. And uh, I think he's been living with Tina for several months now. Um, clearly hit pay dirt when <laughs> Campus Cats rescued him and found a home with Tina for him. And I'm sure at this point you would all like to see these uh, animals, and they can be found online at law.uga.edu slash amicus dash briefs. And we might want to even spell that. That's A-M-I-C-U-S dash B-R-I-E-F-S. And we want to thank you for being with us here today, Anne. It has been a pleasure to talk to you about the history of amicus briefs, which I don't think either of us knew about, and certainly the history of the law dog and our current law dogs. Thanks. I had a great time. Thank you. We have Professor Lisa Milet with us now. She teaches a variety of courses here at the law school, specializing in property, estate planning, and federal taxation. And she is the director of the volunteer organization, Athens Pets. Lisa, could you tell us about Athens Pets and all the work that your group does for homeless animals in our area? 
Sure. Athens Pets is the volunteer group for the athens Clark County Shelter. It's been around since about 2001 as an informal organization. We started by um, having actually one volunteer who would go to the shelter, take photos of the dogs. At that point, it was only a dog shelter. Take photos of the dogs, write up little stories about them, and post them on the website, AthensPets.net. And for about the first 14 years uh, until 2015, that was the main focus of what Athens Pets did. And it really helped a lot with getting um, the word out about the animals that were at the shelter and helping to get them um, into homes, either rescue homes, or rescues or adoptive homes. Uh, but in 2015, we incorporated and became a 501c3 organization and started raising funds for a couple of other purposes as well. So we have... Four other programs we run at this point, in addition to the publicity for the animals at the shelter, we have a medical fund, which provides for the emergency medical costs for the animals at the shelter. Um, we spent about $20,000 last year helping 90 animals um, from small ailments, such as upper respiratory infections, to needing leg amputations after being hit by a car. Um, so that's one of the programs we expanded to. A second one is we spay and neuter a fair number of the animals at the shelter, both to help them get out, but then also by spaying the female dogs, at least, um, all of the animals act much better. If you don't have all the hormones there, everybody is calmer. So it helps everybody get out. Um, and then we have a general fund that takes care of general shelter expenses, like when, we, when the shelter expanded recently and added uh, dog kennels and cat cages, we bought Coranda beds for all of them so that the uh, dogs and cats would have beds to lie on while they're at the shelter. Um, and then we have a community spay-neuter program, which uh, we work with animal control. Animal control identifies animals in the community they, that they think would benefit from being spayed or neutered. Sometimes it's where an owner has dropped off a litter of puppies or kittens and has said, I don't have the money to spay the mom and the dad. They will give them um, Athens Pets information and we will cover the cost of that. Uh, so... We've really <laughs> taken on all of these, but it's been going great. We've uh, really reduced the euthanasia rate at the shelter dramatically by working on all of these programs. And it's it's just really neat to see all of the animals getting healthy, getting into homes. And it's one of the few shelters I know where the animals, after a month in the shelter, are far happier and healthier than when they got there. Well, that's great. And you say there's connections outside of the law school to your organization. There's a lot of UGA people involved. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Athens Pets actually has a lot of UGA ties. So it was students in the law school's business practicum class that incorporated Athens Pets and made it a 501c3 organization two years ago. One of the research and instructional librarians at the main library, Nadine Cohen, was on our initial board of directors and has overseen the volunteer portion of the program for years. Sherry Hines, a UGA law grad, is uh, our director that focuses on cat issues. And then uh, Deb Stanley, who works in the main library as well, uh, takes care of our pet finder listings. So we've got a lot of tendrils out there. And actually, Nadine works with a freshman composition class that comes to the shelter. This is the second year they've done it. And they take photos and interact with the cats and dogs. And we post those on the website as well. And they put together a year-end newsletter that we send out to all of our subscribers so that they're getting an active learning opportunity for as far as writing things in a persuasive way that helps the animals get out and they really have um, understand the impact of what they do. And what are some ways that people in the community can help with the, your organization? We've got a couple things that would help a lot. One is the animals always need interaction. Just go out to the shelter anytime they're open. They're open 10 to 4 every day except Wednesdays and holidays. Go out and spend some time. Get to know them. Um, if you take a cute photo, post it on our Facebook page and we'll share it with everyone. Uh, if you have an insight into an animal's personality, either email us at info at athenspets.net or post it on the Facebook page and we will include that in their bio. So the more perspectives we can get on the animals, the more helpful it is, but also it just is great for them to interact with new people. So that's the number one thing that everybody can engage in. Obviously, we do active fundraisers. We need money for what we're doing. And so donations through our website are helpful. But we have some passive ways to donate, too, that don't actually reduce what uh, individuals have, because I understand a lot of people are already giving what they can. So, for example, we participate in the Kroger Community Rewards Program, where a portion of the amount you spend at Kroger gets directed to Athens Pets if you select us as a charity on their website. Um, and same with Amazon Smile. So you can choose Athens Pets for both of those, and it doesn't affect your pocketbook at all all. And then just getting the word out. I mean, we really need people just to be talking about the fact that the shelter animals are there and they're great animals and 
it should be a first place for people to go and think about finding a new family member. Then finally, if you help any of the rescue groups that pull from us, so if you foster dogs for um, Athens Canine Rescue or for the Athens Area Humane Society or cats for uh, Circle of Friends or the Athens Area Humane Society or for any of the other groups that pull from the shelter, if the rescue groups have more fosters, then they can pull more animals from the shelter, and that's going to help the all of the other animals at the shelter. So even helping our rescue partners is a tremendous help to Athens Pets and the shelter itself. Where is the shelter located? Can you tell us the address? Sure. It's at 125 Buddy Christian Way, which is on the east side of Athens. It's by the airport. Um, even people who haven't flown out of the airport often know where it is, and it's just down the road from the airport. Um, and it's actually a neat facility. They did a big overhaul in the last two years where they expanded the shelter space, but then they also just made it a lot more volunteer friendly. They, uh, for the dogs, they put in big interaction pens so the dogs can actually run and play. And some of the dogs we have tested and um, they have approved playmates. So you can even have at times if staff is helping, you can have two of the dogs out together. And that's, that's a lot of fun. And then on the cat side, there are are also two interaction rooms. So you can take a cat out or if there are multiple cats in one cage, you can take them out together into the room and actually have them interact. So it's a nice facility. And like I said, it's open every day except Wednesdays and holidays from 10 to 4. And so you just go in. If it's your first time, you tell them it's your first time and the staff will tell you what to do. Very cool. Sounds (laughs) great. And you've been doing some research on animal issues. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. I'm actually really excited about the fact that I've been able to combine my interest in animal welfare with my professional life at this point. So I've been involved in rescue in various capacities for about 12 years. I started when I was in the D.C. area and I was on the rescue side of things. And so this is actually, this has transformed quite a bit to be more on the shelter side at this point. But it gives me an opportunity to do empirical research into programs that affect the live disposition rate of animals at shelters, which is something that is difficult to research in many ways just because most shelters don't have the funding or the ability to really implement a program and see how it plays out. And so I'm working with Jesse Dyer, who's an anthropology grad student here at UGA, on an empirical piece looking at the programs um, we've implemented at the shelter and the effect on the live disposition rate of the dogs, particularly just because that's easier to focus on. And then I also have a more theoretical traditional law piece on backyard breeding and looking at it as sort of a precursor offense in the sense that backyard breeding is the low-scale commercial breeding, usually of dogs, sometimes of cats, and it's outside of any sort of regulatory regime. And often it's in conflict with the regulations. And so here, for example, you need to have a breeding license if you're producing and selling more than one litter in a 12-month period of dogs or cats. And Many people don't do that. And it's one of those things that flies under the radar screen many times just because one extra litter a year doesn't seem like it does a whole lot. But part of the problem is that it's tied into larger offenses. So in some, there are reasons why people looking for guard dogs, for example, or fighting dogs would prefer a dog that's not coming from a licensed breeder because it's not able to be tracked. And so now you have these dogs engaging in as part of a larger criminal enterprise that are being sought, in fact, because they are coming from backyard breeders instead of registered breeders. And so there's a reason to enforce our breeding statutes, not just because it affects pet overpopulation um, and the welfare of the animals actually being sold, but it ties into these larger criminal enterprises that it's hard to get into otherwise. And so by stopping the backyard breeding, we can cut off a supply for, you know, guard dogs for drug dealing, for example, or um, other illicit activities. Do you have any recommendations for law students who might be interested in the in animal law in general and courses they might want to take or resources they could look into? Sure. Professor Appel sometimes teaches an animal law class, so that's an option. Um, I've done independent research projects with individuals interested in animal control issues. And in fact, I'm working with a student right now at looking at both our tethering and our mandatory spay-neuter provisions and asking whether or not uh, on a statewide level they're ones that make sense and what might be a better approach to those issues. So she's doing a lot of research there. So individual projects are possible. We have an alum, Sherwin Kamad, who does a lot of um, prosecution of animal abusers and things like that. And so she's a great contact. Um, she was actually uh, ran the student animal legal defense 
group when she was here. And getting involved with the student animal law associations is a great way to figure out what the issues are and where there's some movement. Because the truth is, this is a really exciting area of law because it's something that animals are changing very much from the sort of traditional property paradigm for what are animals into something that is more like a guardianship model for uh, the relationships, which changes many of the legal structures that we think about them. And in some um, jurisdictions, in fact, the tort claims are changing from being ones that are focused on injuries to animals, for example, as property, and ones that focus more on uh, broader damages that might be occurring. And so it's an area that's interesting, but to some extent here, you have to pave your own way, but that's not a problem. We do have the resources. We have alums that are in this area. I'm very active in this area. Um, and so if a student's interested in it, I think the best thing they can do is probably reach out to me and let me know this is something they're interested in because um, I have a number of different things going on that I can always use student help with, and I've got the contacts to at least let them know what the world of possibilities is. Well, Professor Milet, thank you for all you do for the animals. One thing before you go, uh, we would be very curious to hear about your own pets. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few too many, as might be expected. I have five dogs. So I have um, I have Willow, who came from West Virginia originally, and she's the one that got me into the whole rescue thing. She was uh, considered unadoptably shy by her shelter, and she is an absolutely marvelous dog. And so... She is never going to pass away because I don't know what I would do. Um, and then I ha actually have three dogs that came from Athens, Clark County Animal Control. I have Bagel, who is a senior beagle, and he was surrendered there um, after he was diagnosed with diabetes and his former owners weren't prepared to deal with that. I have Kaylee, who is, uh, she she's my special child. She was in a locked run at animal control and because she was very scared in the environment. And so she's really blossomed into a great member of the family. And then Holly, who got me back into Athens Pets. I had been one of the website volunteers for um, my first couple of years down here, but had taken a break after I had adopted Kaylee because I had a lot going on in my life. I took a dog to the shelter who was running loose in the neighborhood um, and I met Holly while I was there and fell in love with her. And I adopted her, but that got me back into the whole Rescue Athens Pets thing in 2014. And then I have Indy, who is a spay-neuter uh, event find. So she was a neighborhood dog, basically, in an area where we went to do one of the free spay-neuter events last year. The Athens Area Humane Society, Athens Pets, and the Animal Companion Rescue Foundation were doing free surgeries in an RV that was uh, totally tricked out for surgeries. And Indy got on our list for uh, having a spay surgery by the person who oversaw the area we were at. And when it came to the end of the day, when we were waiting for her to get picked up, up, that person informed us that, in fact, she didn't have a family, that they had moved away and she had nowhere to go. So I was supposed to take her to the shelter, took her home because it was after hours and she has stayed. So those are my five dogs. And I also have a part-time dog, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> your heart is very big for, for your animals. Thanks again, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. <laughs> Wendy Moore is in the studio with us right now to share some resources specific to animal law and animal rights with us. Wendy is the acquisitions librarian at the Law Library and oversees the Technical Services Department. She is also extremely active in multiple professional organizations, including the American Association of Law Libraries, and is the faculty advisor for the UGA student group Speak Out for Species. Wendy, we know you have a soft spot for animals. Uh, can you start by telling us a little bit about your own furry friend? Oh, yes. So my dog, Elise, is 13 years old, and she is a chow border collie mix. So she has all the um, paranoia of a border collie and uh, is is also uh, super paranoid like a chow. So she makes her a fun dog. She was a returned foster dog. She was rescued from Athens Cannon Rescue and uh, pulled her from the athens Clark County Animal Control when she was about five to six months old. And uh, she was a foster, and then she was adopted. And then she didn't quite gel with the family she had been adopted to. So she came back into Athens Cannon Rescue, and she lived with us for six months, at which point we decided we were her forever homes. And she's been with us ever since. Wonderful. 
Uh, as the acquisitions librarian, we know that you have a strong handle on the resources that the library has to offer. We also know that uh, some subjects are easier to find resources on than others. Uh, this seems like it may be one of those challenging subjects. So can you share with us a little bit about the challenges of finding resources specific to animal law? Yes. Uh, so animal law is, isn't is actually a particular area of law in and of itself. It's made up of lots of different areas of law. So it could involve criminal law, torts, state planning, some international law occasionally. It sort of depends on what you're looking for as to where that might direct you to look. It also comes into play with how you might do searches for things. So your terminology might be really important. So if you're trying to look up in a county code or a city code about dogs, you actually might be wanting to search for the term canine. There often are more legalistic terms that are used or, um, or even kind of more medical terms that are used. If you're even looking at the state level, a lot of uh, laws pertaining to animals are actually fall under the agriculture area. And uh, what library resources would you recommend to a student or faculty member on the subject of animal law in particular? The law library does have an animal law research guide that was developed for the animal law seminar that's offered here at the law school. And that has a lot of good links on it. So, and you can get that on the library's homepage. Uh, the Hine Online has a subsection that is on animal studies. So it's called Animal Studies, Law, Welfare, and Rights. And it has titles from the Animal Legal Defense Fund and the Animal Welfare Institute. And is a gathering of a lot of both secondary as well as some primary uh, materials, both current and going back into the 19th century. So it's good for historical research as well. There's several books I would start with that are kind of key books. Probably the most important one to start with if you're really interested in learning more about animal law is Stephen Wise's Rattling the Cage, really the, one of the foundational books on animal law. Stephen Wise taught some of the first animal law courses at the University of Vermont. He's, he's definitely one of the leaders in establishing animal law as a academic pursuit uh, in law schools. Uh, there's a 2016 uh, animal law in a nutshell, as well as a 2016 understanding animal law. So those are just kind of your, your basic study guides that you might use for any prepping any law school class. Also, the Animal Law Cases and Materials is a case book, and it's sort of the one and only case book that's out there for animal law. It's in its fifth edition already, and I suspect there'll be another one coming soon. So, Also, there's a book by uh, uh, Faure that is called Animal Law, Welfare, Interest, and Rights, and that's also a good introduction. I also see that um, you have with you sort of a list of some, some documentaries that you would recommend. Could you tell us more about specific movies that are some of your favorites, perhaps? Sure. These are mainly all fairly recent documentaries and are pretty widely available. You, a lot of these are available on Netflix. Uh, a recent film we just showed on campus was called A Dog Named Gucci, and it's all about what happened and how... Uh, a, just a few people worked really hard to create a felony offense for animal cruelty in Alabama. And they worked for over a decade on that, and they finally got it passed. And it was a lot of what that was happening in Alabama was actually also driving Georgia to create felony, felony animal cruelty laws as well. And so I, I really recommend that film. It's a relatively small production, but it, it's really well done and, and really inspiring to make you feel like you can go out and make change in the world. And you don't have to have uh, everybody behind you. You can, you can get everybody behind you with a good story. The Paw Project is a really interesting film that focuses on cat declawing and issues surrounding that. It uh, was a kind of a generally practiced veterinary pra you know, uh, practice that happens with cats in the United States. It's actually outlawed in a lot of countries. Um, most of Europe, it's outlawed. And this talks about some uh, efforts in certain cities to outlaw um, declawing of cats and what some of the issues are surrounding that. I found it super engaging. 
it explained everything that was wrong with the cat that we had growing uh, that I had growing up and uh, the issues that that some cats can experience when they've been declawed and so I I really recommend that for people because I think it it's a really eye-opening film but also makes you think a little bit more about how about also this legal process and it, it shows a lot of how people are trying to move some of these things through city councils especially out in California the student organization uh, Speak Out for Species has a, is it yearly film festival where they show um, some of these great documentaries and there's discussion afterwards? That's right. So we do every February there is a film. We have a film festival called the Animal Voices Film Festival. And we usually focus on films that show something about the human-animal relationship and how when humans and animals kind of interact in society, where some of those issues can be at. And those films can focus on companion animals. Uh, they focus on wildlife. They focus on uh, animals in captivity. So it can, it can be a, a wide variety of topics. In addition to Speak Out for Species, what are some other organizations that would be great starting points for students either beginning their research or if they want to get involved? Well, here at the law school, we have a student chapter of the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And the Animal Legal Defense Fund is a, a longtime uh, organization. It was really one of the first out there in the area of animal law. And they try to make sure that everybody has information and um, connect people so that they, they have these student chapters across the country to help uh, new lawyers be up on a lot of these issues. And they also offer their website uh, has a ton of information on it. So they have a much longer list of, of documentaries that you can watch. They have a list of books and resources. So there's a, there's a lot of information on their website that would be helpful for anyone who's interested in these topics. The State Bar of Georgia has an animal law section, and that started up maybe about eight years ago. And a couple of UGA graduates have been uh, the past chairs of that of that sections. And there's also an organization in Atlanta that's fairly new, and they're called Animal Law Source. And it's made up of two attorneys. They both had started their careers as prosecutors and then got into animal law, either through private practice or or some of the other work they were doing. And they actually do training for not just lawyers, but judges, um, animal control officers, other law enforcement officers. They offer training uh, with credits for um, continuing legal for continuing education, and they do training about such like things like best practices how you identify when there's maybe animal welfare issues going on or animal abuse, how you document some of that so that things could be prosecuted later, and uh, also just letting people kind of network with each other and know who to contact among the states. So it's a really great resource to have here in Georgia, and I think they're doing a lot to get issues about animals out there. And they have, on their website, they have a great FAQ. And that's great for the general public as well as for professionals in the whole of the judicial systems. Well, this has been such a great experience talking to you, Wendy. We're so glad that we could have you here to share your expertise, not only about the subject matter, but about the resources that you've told us about, the link to the Lib Guide, that's the research guide for animal law. Um, so you can go ahead and look that up, would be libguides.law.uga.edu slash animal underscore law. And thanks again, Wendy. Thanks. This was fun. I'm sure we will have you back in the future. Oh, I hope so. Some other library resources. I got all resources. sorts of library resources to tell you about. So, <laughs> Thank you, and keep up the good work. Thanks. 
We have with us now in the studio 2L Deborah Yates, who already holds an LLM and is a student here at Georgia Law. Uh, she is vice president of one of the organizations that we've already talked about with a couple of different guests in this episode, the Animal Legal Defense Fund. She's here to talk to us today about their work. Can you tell us a little bit about the organization, its mission, and some of the activities you guys do? So the Animal Legal Defense Fund is um, an organization that is uh, located in California, and they are animal lawyers. Uh, uh, they don't rescue animals. They are not like on the field like you know Humane Society and other organizations. They file suit. So. Um, they file suit and try to change laws. When the laws are not considering uh, animals, they fight for the rights of farming animals, preservation, anything that is related um, to animal life in general. Uh, they also support uh, some DA's offices, like, for instance, in Cobb County, uh, the DA office there has a specific prosecutors that only prosecute animal uh, abuse cases. You know, it's expensive. You need evidence. You need to preserve it. So the Animal Legal Defense Fund actually helps them financially. And so, And then they have several chapters in, in, in several law schools, and they help the students. They provide scholarships. If you're interested in practice animal law, um, you can intern with them in, in California. Uh, you know, they have student conventions. They give materials. They have grants. <laughs> So they are, they are really good. They, they, they're basically animal lawyers. That's all they are. And of course, as any organization like that, they work with a lot of donations. What kind of things are you guys in the student chapter here at our law school doing throughout any given semester? Mostly spread awareness that this is a field of law. You know, a lot of universities actually, and U UJ has, has in the past offered animal law. Uh, classes, this can be a career. You know, this doesn't need to be something that you just do on the side, you know, especially now where environmental issues and animal law issues are coming out. This can be a career. It might not have been a career 20 years ago, but today is a possibility. Um, there are great organizations out there. Animal Law Source is one, and they are in um, Atlanta, actually. Like myself, doing the persecutorial clinic and going for plans to be an assistant DA, this can be a part of a career if you are also looking into the prosecutorial field because animal abuse is a crime, right? And so last semester, we had a prosecutor uh, that does pursue animal abuse criminals, and uh, she came and she spoke to us. She explained also the link between animal abuse and, and criminality in general. We are next semester going to uh, feature a movie night. Um, there are some very good documentaries out there uh, relating animal issues right now where lawyers are involved or the legal field is involved. So it's more like our awareness. Hey, this is ex exists. You know, this is not just something you do on a side. This is very important. So what got you um, personally interested in this organization? Are there specific issues that are really dear to your heart that have encouraged you to follow this? Uh, I always loved animals. Two years ago, I got my two puppies. I'm an immigrant, so I only have my husband here. I don't have a family here. So my puppies are my family. And the amount of connection that they were capable, uh, it just surprised me, you know, how how sentient they were, how, under, how they could understand me, and how they could relate to me in an intelligent level. You know, not, of course, not like another human, but completely awareness. Then I start reading about things like that, and then I had some experience living in Canada. I had a friend that had a, a, a farm, and it was a, a, a fattening farm, right? So you have the beautiful cows here in the pasture. Like when I drive to my home, which is half an hour here in, in, in country, I see the cows grazing and playing and, you know. But when I lived in Canada, where they are shipped to after a certain age, they go to this fattening farm where they are completely locked in, in into this tiny 
barn. And of course, the barn has an outside area, but they are still very, like, it's like many cows and some very little space. You know, there's no grass for them to... Um, to be is just pure mud and, and, and they are feed corn, you know, so they can get really, really fat. And by looking at those two sides of how we are treating them and using them, I, I realized that, that there is some moral issue there and it, it was not fair. And by being there, I had contact with the cow. I know it's it's going to sound crazy, but I did. Like, I would walk um, among them, and they will come to you like a dog and lick your hands, you know? Um, so just this touch of, like, those are beings that are sharing this earth with us, and they are completely and totally vulnerable to the decisions that we make, right? Somebody needs to preserve them, said somebody needs to take care of them because they are, they are living beings. They are sentient beings. And, you know, they deserve to be considered when we are making decisions. Uh, it was Temple Grandin that said, you know, and she, she was responsible for putting in place uh, lots of humane methods of production, right? So she was not against of us using animals in a sense, like for our nutrition or for things like that. I think it's it, you know, even animals use other animals for nutrition. But independent of that, um, she said, we, we own to them. They give us so much. We own to them that if we are going to do this, we need to do this in the most, you know, humane, conscious possible way. And and I think that that's where I stand, you know. It's being hard because um, more that I get involved, more I know. <laughs> and more it hurts because out there is it's... It's pretty rough on animals. <laughs> we just need to be conscious that as long as we are living, we consume. You know, any animal consume. This earth works like that. Um, so if we are going to consume, let's be conscious about it and respectful. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Yeah. Um, we, we would like to also ask you a little bit about your pets. You mentioned a little bit. Um, can you tell us, you know, their names and the types of animals that you have? Uh, so Matilda, uh, I call her Maddie. She is a border collie, and uh, I got her from one of my neighbors uh, who has a um, a cheap farm. So her parents, they herd um, their, their cheap. So she's very smart. Um, she doesn't know she is a dog. Um, <laughs> she thinks she's my helper. So uh, she loves to be out there when I'm working in the garden. She feels she's helping um, you know, I can walk with her. I walk with her all over my property, and uh, she's always keeping eye contact with me, you know. Uh, <laughs> and then I have Stella, and uh, Stella is a, a, a mountain cur, uh, which is a not, not a very famous um, breed. Um, and I say breed, but she was a rescue, too. <laughs> um, but um, a mountain cur uh, was first bred in the mountains of Virginia, and they are small game hunters, so squirrels and rabbits. Um, so she's a hunter, um, and she will follow those little creatures everywhere. But um, she's really pretty and really docile. Uh, they both are very loving. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, thank you for having we're me. We're so grateful to, to have you to speak t with us about these issues and also the the organization that we have here at the law school. And speaking of student organizations, we also have with us today Alex Glut of S the Student Affairs Office. And Alex uh, not only oversees this organization, but I believe all of the organizations here at Georgia Law. So Alex, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about the different organizations that the law school has that students could get involved in, in addition to the Animal Legal Defense Fund? Of course, yeah. We have over 30 student organizations that are registered through the law school as student organizations, which is awesome. And they range from everything from what we talked about today, Animal Legal Defense, to Women's Law Student Association, uh, Trial Lawyers Association, really anything that you can think of there, it's probably an organization you can join to learn more about that topic, which is really awesome. Because as Deborah talked about, 
you know, with Animal Legal Defense Fund, it gives you an end to maybe a national organization that is going to be able to provide you with information about the field and, you know, potentially internships or grant opportunities. Student organizations will alert you to events that they're having where you maybe be able to network with attorneys in the field or other law students who are interested. So there's a lot of great social, academic, and professionalism career angles to all the student organizations. So I just encourage any students that are listening to go to the student organizations page, which you can get through through the students tab on the website and see if anything, you know, lights your fire and get involved because, you know, there's a lot more to law school than just sitting in class and student organizations can help illuminate all those things for you. If you're interested in a specific area of law and you're looking to get more into it, hit up talk to me, talk to CDO, you know, that we always have alumni, wonderful, very accomplished alumni out there who are willing to to talk to you and help you get connected with the field. So don't hesitate. We, we want to help. So just ask. Thank you for being with us, Alex. And thank you for all you do for the law school. Before you go, could you share with us, uh, do you have any animals at home? I sure do. Um, (laughs) I have two cats. Their names are Cindy and Greg. They are Athens natives. Uh, They were found in the ventilation system of the Holiday Inn Express off of Broad Street. Oh, my. Yeah, they're big and fat, and they like to eat and cuddle and, you know, chase dust. And they're very, they're just your run-of-the-mill cats. And um, they were rescued, like I said, so I love them very much. Well, thank you both for being with us today. It was a pleasure to have Deborah and Alex here with us. Thank Thank you. you. We'd like to welcome Marie Mize, who is the circulation manager here at the Law Library. She also serves as UGA's representative on the staff council of the University System of Georgia. And she was recently named the Law School's Employee of the Year. As part of all she does to make the law library such a great place to work and study, Marie organizes several activities at the end of each semester to help our students cope with those final exam stressful times. And Marie, um, tell us something about these stress busters. Oh, gosh, we've been using stress busters for years. Ann Puckett became director of the library back in 1994. And one of the things that she did was she actually bought some Guatemalan worry dolls and gave them to the students before they went to their exams. And that's really where it started. Then she is such a huge Jigsaw Puzzle fan. And um, in fact, even to today, she brings Jigsaw Puzzles to us to put out. So she started quietly putting a few Jigsaw Puzzles for the students to put out. Uh, We went with Jigsaw Puzzles, a little wooden puzzles and stuff throughout the years until this, probably about uh, three years ago, we really expanded it a lot. Um, Some of the things we're doing now is we have uh, bowling in the basement. We put up little styrofoam pins and stuff and actually have that set out. We have mini golf in the aisles, which was really big. Uh, We bought coloring kits when the rage happened a few years ago with adult coloring. We added a couple of years ago uh, a 10 minute uh, sit- seated back massage that the students really like. And that has been a really popular one. Can, yes. you, can you tell us a little bit about how, how quickly that fills up? Oh my, so for, well, the first time we did it, um, we actually thought that the site had broken, <laughs> that we had a problem because within 30 minutes, every one of the, uh, the appointments were taken. And we've, over the last few times, have added more and more. So the students really look forward to that one. And uh, last semester, we added the word search. Uh, Jason Tabinis came up with the idea of using our big screen TV that you can actually do the, um, I forgot, what's it called? It's a touch screen. Touch screen, screen. that's it. Yeah, Yeah. and you can... it, That's addictive. It is. <laughs> and we got some faculty and uh, senior administrators <laughs> hooked, hooked on that. And so that's one, uh, when it's set up, is that just in the front of the library? It's just in the front, yeah, as, as you come in. And many times you, some of the students will just stop and do two of them and go, yay, and head on out. <laughs> yeah. um, 
That's wonderful. Of all the stress busters that you've mentioned so far, what would you say is the most popular stress buster with students? Or is, does there seem to be a stress buster that's more popular with 1Ls or more popular with 3Ls? Not really that way, but I do find that they're either loving like the jigsaw puzzle or the word search. Those uh, are the two the big two ones. Big, well, of course, the massages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but after the massages, yeah. And I find that while some like both, there's some purists in there. that uh, uh, I've, I had one student, this is last year, that we put the jigsaw puzzles out a day late, and we heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> what so. types of puzzles do you guys have? I know, I know I've seen you, Leslie, at the front doing some I jigsaw puzzles during exam time. Puzzles, I wish they could be out all year, but I'd probably <laughs> spend too much time in front of them. I've seen uh, library director Carol Watson doing the jigsaw mm-hmm. puzzles from time to time. I feel like we have a photo of her yes. really, really working <laughs> on one of those puzzles. Yeah. <laughs> and the, I think my favorite one of all time was the Escher puzzle Ooh, because it was so difficult. So hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We we start out with small. I mean, we've got a couple of Spider-Man and Iron Man that are just maybe 15 to 20 pieces <laughs> to put out at the beginning. And then we go into Star Wars has always been a favor. The 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 Hobbit, the ring was the circular mm-hmm. one. So one of I liked the most because it was so hard was actually um, a lady in a bubble bath. And so it's oh. like too many shades of white <laughs> <everywhere>. <laughs> that one. the wall and everything. It was just uh, tremendous. Yeah. And lots of nature scenes mm-hmm. and things that, you know, all of these. Some calming. Exactly. Yeah. All these activities like mm-hmm. really help you get your mind off of everything else for a minute. Definitely. Yeah, that's the point. Just uh, some type of little break. Um, I didn't mention we have DVDs to check out. Yes. And one student a couple of years ago would get um, Liar Liar, and he would just put it in to, to listen to his favorite jokes <laughs> in that, and then he'd bring it back, and he was ready to start studying again. Are there some, some DVDs in the collection that you find that get checked out each time exams come around? Some of some favorite DVDs yeah. that students really like to relax? Like My Cousin to. Vinny. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. yeah. And we have one more stress buster listed that isn't really a stress buster that we can take full credit for, but that is provided by UGA, which is Pause and Relax. And it seems to be something they set up outside of multiple UGA buildings. Could you tell us a little bit about what that is? And that kind of ties into our animal theme. Right. Um, Right. We really look forward to pause and relax. And what they do is that they get um, therapy dogs and puppies. And one year they had this really cute miniature goat. And um, oh. <laughs> and they do. They set up like for us, it's perfect because the main library sets up right in the quad and it's right in front of the law school. Um, they also set up at um, in front of the science library down on South Campus, the Miller Learning Center. Um, Adderhold uh, Hall, and also the Ramsey Center, which I was not aware of that till just now. I have to say I went to the Ramsey Center last year because there was a therapy cat. <gasps> oh, a, a special a treat. gorgeous Maine Coon cat oh my named Oliver, and I highly recommend if you can catch up with Oliver. That is cool. With him I have, for a minute. <laughs> I have never seen a therapy cat. That's awesome. It's <laughs> awesome. Wonderful. But, uh, and that's actually, I think that's going to be May the 1st, and uh, so it'll be a Monday, which will be a good day to go take advantage of it. And Excellent. From 11 to 1. Mm-hmm. Right. Do you have a personal favorite, Marie, for when you're at the desk and feeling a little overwhelmed? <laughs> which one of these would be, uh, would be your favorite? I have to admit I fell in love with the word search <laughs> <laughs> this past year because it is something that I could just go... Uh, a lot of times the students will finish it and they won't set up a new one. So I could go pick my favorite genre, you know, Harry Potter or Paris or something like that and <laughs> do the first one. <laughs> so. Excellent. Um, we also uh, wanted to ask you about some of your... Also, I uh, wanted to ask you about some of your...